Like them or not, better prosperity gauges are hardly a novel innovation. Since the 1970s, for example, in the Himalayas, the Buddhist kingdom of Bhutan, with GDP per person less than that of the Congo, has used gross national happiness instead. Its GNH score turns out to be as elevated as its location. And back down here at sea level, there's the GPI. It simply takes into account not only our economy, but the health of our environment, the health of our society. Dave Gosshorn works for Maryland, the first U.S. state to adopt a metric called the Genuine Progress Indicator. Made up of 26 different factors, nine of them environmental. He walked us around Annapolis to explain. When we cut down an acre of trees to put a strip mall in, that strip mall puts people to work. It contributes to our economy, our tax base. All those are very good things. And it's GDP and it's going G up as a result. Exactly. At the same time, it is costing us to clean up the water that is degraded as a result of taking away those trees. We, as a society, recognize that, but we don't account for that in the GDP. And the GPI is a way of doing that. The GPI does it by subtracting an estimated value of water pollution from total economic output. Also subtracted, the presumed costs of climate change. In Maryland, we have sea level as a result, in part, of climate change is increasing considerably a foot over the past century. So one foot right here, this is a foot higher than it was a century ago? Yes. And the best projections are that that rate will increase over the next century, even faster than a foot. That has major impacts to a lot of our low-lying ants, islands, shorelines where people live, farm fields that are now inundated with salt water where they can't produce crops. And how do you put a number on cropless fields or polluted water? Economists have gone out and surveyed the general public and asked them questions such as, what would you be willing to pay to bring your local river up to a state where you could swim in it? In a national comparison of the two measures, GPI and GDP grew together until about 1980 when GPI flatlined. In Maryland, GPI has risen modestly since then, but it still trails GDP growth. I hear in the news all the time when people comment about, well, the economic indicators are looking up, we're coming out of the recession, you frequently hear people comment, but I don't feel any better. And I think this is a reflection of that. And that in turn may hinge on another component of the GPI, social well-being. Annapolis being the landing place for the hero of Alex Haley's roots, Kunta Kinte, we took a seat next to the author to probe the value of leisure. How do you calculate the value of, say, Alex Haley reading to these kids? Well, if it counts as education, the value of an education is included in the GPI. If you count it as leisure time, not having that time is counted as a loss in the GPI. And we also have the value of housework, which uh, includes things like cleaning the house and dusting, but also interacting with your children. Um, that's a value that's in the GPI. What about air pollution from cars or uh, the amount of time it takes you to commute to work? Cost of commuting is considered in the GPI, and that is one that's hurting Maryland because here in Maryland, we spend more time in our cars commuting to and from work than most states in the nation. But people will tell you a great radio show comes on and they go, wait a second, I'm listening to NPR and loving exactly. my commute. Yeah. Exactly. And to some degree, what we're doing with the GPI is putting a price on the unpriceable. But at least we're being consistent and seeing whether they go up or down. Maryland's GPI is boosted by a highly educated population. But remember, even here, GPI hasn't gone up as much as GDP for years now. So why? Gosshorn says a big reason is what Joe Stiglitz highlighted in 2009, rising economic inequality. The same amount of money spent by a few very wealthy people would be attributed differently to the GPI than an equal amount of money spent a little bit by a lot of people. So imagine that in the extreme, one Marylander earned most of the state's money and amassed a fleet of fully loaded Mercedes she never drove, while the rest were reduced to commuting by bus. In that case, GDP might rise, since car sales boost the value of total output, but overall welfare wouldn't. It's a subtle point, a debatable one.
but even the BEA Steve Landefeld agrees. Distribution of income may be the answer to me to this problem of the disconnect between GDP and GDP per capita going up and most Americans feeling down. But Landefeld has serious reservations about alternatives like the GPI. The subjectivity is the Achilles heel of it. How much do I subtract for the commuting time? You know, if I enjoy my commute, maybe it's one thing, maybe not. They end up being systems of, of indicators that are troubling for an economist who's trying to put together objective accounts or at least not make normative judgments about what should be. Then again, all economic indicators involve some subjectivity, says Zachary Garibel. One synthetic number that purports to describe lived reality with an average has to make choices about what do you include, what do you add, what do you exclude, because you can't include everything. And so long as you don't, you can't really quantify human well-being, especially if there's any truth to the maxim that the best things in life are free.